So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce to you, and please welcome with me, Mary Spiel. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that um, amazing introduction. Thanks, Lee. And then also for inviting me to be part of uh, this convocation. I've been very excited being backstage. What an amazing event. I am tremendously honored to be standing in front of all of you, all of you educators, because you truly birth the future. You change the course of life for people like myself. And I know it's not often that you get people coming back to tell you about the great work that you do. I believe that you all birth uh, the future. And so for that, I would like to thank you very much for everything that you do. My own life has been tremendously impacted by my education, which has allowed me to experience things that I never imagined possible. Stuff like working on a NASA project, sending heat probes into space, looking for intelligent life forms, and more recently, working with the Department of State as an evangelist on behalf of the US, traveling all over the world, China, Mexico, Ukraine, Pakistan, and the list goes on. And I always get the same question, no matter where I go, people ask me about my process for a lot of the uncommon goals that I've been able to achieve. And um, I usually say it's not rocket science, I just happen to be one. Um, really, my life is built around a fundamental principle that all of life is truly what we imagine it to be. And that when we're intentional about the type of future that we want to create, we can truly achieve it. And how I came to this conclusion, in order to understand how I came to this conclusion, I will share my journey with you. I was born in uh, Syracuse, New York, to Ghanaian parents. My parents are from Ghana, where I grew up. When I was still a child, we went back to Ghana. There were some amazing times, but there were also some very intense times of unrest. Um, very similar to some of what we're seeing around the world today. In fact, uh, a defining moment for me came when I was about eight years old, and the government was overtaken by military rogues. There were soldiers running the streets with guns. There were friends of mine whose parents were actually taken away, shot to death by firing squad. Uh, my own father taken, tortured, beating, etc. cetera. Uh, many days without food and nights that I remember just crying myself to sleep. But in the midst of all of that, there was that one place that I could always escape, and that was within my books. And I held on to my books because I believed then, just as I believe now, that it would one day be my ticket to a new existence, to a different existence. So when I turned 16, somehow I convinced my parents to send me back to America where I knew I could have a better life. And they did so at great sacrifice. Um, I remember it almost as if it was yesterday when I arrived back in the States, September 29th, 1989. Around 9.39 p.m., we started to make our descent into uh, the North Carolina, the Charleston um, International Airport. Seeing all those lights, I felt like I was truly landing on the moon, and this was North Carolina. <laughs> Imagine if it had been Las Vegas. <laughs> I probably would have lost my mind. I was picked up by friends of my, uh, my parents who lived in South Carolina where I would live for a year and we drove from North Carolina to South Carolina. And during those late night hours as we drove um, along the streets, I remember seeing things that I considered bastions of you know, America. These are things that I had only seen in movies like the Red Coke machine at the 7-Eleven. <laughs> I was very easily impressed back then. <laughs> and uh, some of the tallest buildings I had ever seen in my life. And we drove past streets with names of dreamers, Martin Luther King Boulevard, Lincoln, Edison. As we drove, I had a moment of insight. I looked around and realized that all these things that I was looking at, these global things, things that I had only seen in my imagination, that they had all started in somebody else's imagination as mere thoughts. And so I set out to live out my own imagination as well. 
before coming to America, I did my research. <laughs> I did my research by watching a movie called Coming to America, <laughs> in which Prince Hakim goes to New York to find his bride. Well, a day after graduation, I left South Carolina, took the midnight train, and I went to New York in search of new possibilities and perhaps to find Prince Hakim. <laughs> I arrived at Grand Central Station. I literally any mini mini mode it, ended up on the number three train, destination Brooklyn, and rode it till the very last stop. New Lots became my home, where I lived very joyfully in the midst of blight. Like Prince Hakeem, I got a job at McDonald's. Well, it was McDowell in the movie, but I got a job <laughs> at McDonald's. And it was the happiest day of my life. Th these were things I had seen in the movies, and here I was working at McDonald's. I was working on fries. I was a deep fryer. Very exciting. <laughs> And then I got my first paycheck, $178. I converted it to the Ghanaian money, and I was an instant millionaire. <laughs> I had never seen that much money in my life, so I thought there had been a mistake. I went to see my boss, Eduardo, to ask him if there had been a mistake. I said, is this all for me? He thought I was complaining. <laughs> so he said, I'll tell you what, you want to raise, you want more money? I'll give you 50 cents for an hour, but you have to work as a cashier. And you can start training today. That's when I learned my first lesson in American business. Don't be afraid to ask for more. <laughs> Even when you're completely undeserving. <laughs> so I became a cashier. And becoming a cashier was the best and worst thing that ever happened to me. I was terrible at it. Here I was in the biggest McDonald's. It felt like the largest McDonald's in the world. New York City, and New Yorkers won their coffee and McMuffins and all of that, and the only thing that stood between them and their quick breakfast was this foreign moron. That's why they called me, hey moron. So there was always a very long line in front of my cash register. I felt I let everybody down. My friends on fries were like, man, you blew our chances of getting promoted. <laughs> My family, I knew this isn't what they sent me to America to do. And one day, I heard a commercial about doing more with your life by 5 a.m. than most people do in a lifetime. I said, whatever it is, sign me up. It was for the Army. <laughs> so on my first day off, I went to the Army recruiting office to sign up. When I went, the Army recruiter was getting ready to take a smoke break, so he put me in the hallway. While sitting there, I looked up and saw this handsome man with his very big smile and even bigger biceps, <laughs> walking towards you know, where I was sitting. Big smile was the Air Force recruiter. Needless to say, I ended up joining the Air Force. <laughs> I was 17, and people would ask me, why did you join the Air Force? The recruiter was cuter. <laughs> it made perfect sense at 17. But it was in the Air Force that I learned about the inner workings of technology. I was a satellite communications technician. I ended up in Desert Storm, and in one of the days, our communication equipment had broken down, and I managed to fix it. And the engineer on duty pulled me aside and said, hey, you should really look into becoming an engineer. There is a scholarship for outstanding airmen to go back to college, but there's only one for all the US Air Forces in Europe but you might want to look into it. So I did. And to my surprise, it came back and I scored the highest in electronics, mathematics, science, all of that. And that year I was the recipient for the scholarship to go back to school. So he <laughs> So here I was, I didn't even know engineering existed as a discipline. I didn't know any engineers. And I had come to believe technology and all that stuff was for those other people. But here I was, I went back to school to study electrical engineering at Syracuse. And once again, I graduated number one in my class 
of all men. And for that reason, today I work with people and technology because I truly believe it's not an achievement gap, it's not a capacity gap, it's just an exposure gap. Exposing people to as much as possible so they don't stumble around into their destiny the way that I did uh, into mine. And then I went on to Georgia Tech, uh, studied electrical engineering and computer science with a focus in deep space. And from there I said I received my Jedi powers. <laughs> because I got more opportunity than I had ever imagined possible. I got a chance to work as a rocket scientist. Actually, here is uh, a satellite that I designed, Pass 4, uh, going into space, putting my signature on it before it left. And very soon, the Boeing company came calling. I was one of three engineers hand-selected to come up with the technology that today has changed the entire movie industry. And I hold several of the patents for digital cinema, which is the means by which today movies are delivered uh, to the theaters. Star Wars was one of the movies that uh, we distributed with the uh, digital cinema technology. Boeing later sold it for uh, billions of dollars, the technology. Um, and uh, you know, from there, I had a lot of the movie studios asking me to help transition them uh, in different ways. So I launched my own company, uh, Next Galaxy, uh, doing business with the likes of Clear Channel, Microsoft, uh, and the list goes on. And today, I'm the president and founder of uh, Next Galaxy still. Now we're focusing on virtual reality for healthcare, education, and also for entertainment. I also work with the West Africa Foundation, helping put schools and hospitals in places uh, where they're not within 100 miles of schools or hospitals. The interesting thing is, a lot of the principles that guided my journey were from my greatest teachers, my father and a lot of the teachers that I came in contact with. And I'll share four of you know, such uh, key principles uh, with you. I've always been different, never really fitting in to any particular space. You know, I love the arts and I love the sciences. I love the creative and the technical, always looking for a way to combine the two. And I found my place with my company in the sense that I was able to relate to the movie directors and also to the engineers and understand what both of them were doing, which is the foundation of Next Galaxy, bringing together the creative and the technical. By having the courage to be different, I was able to come up with something significant. And I believe that our difference, our difference is truly what allows us to create something unique and significant to offer to the world. The other aspect of my life that I notice is that every significant milestone is tied to a person or an army of people. No one ever makes it alone. It's all about people. It's all about people. And in fact, even when you look at math, the number one is not a multiplier. I actually call it a mathematical perversity because no matter what you multiply it by, it doesn't grow. And so it is in life. A story that I heard once, which I don't know if it's you know, an urban uh, myth or true, was about the president and the first lady going back to her um, to her hometown, and as they were eating, one of the bums came up to the first lady, and the first lady talked with him for over 20 minutes. When she came back to the table, the president said, who's that? And she said, that's the guy I almost married. And the president said, well, you're a very lucky lady. <laughs> because if you had married him, you wouldn't be the first lady. And she looked at him, with a smile and said, no, you're the lucky one because if I had married him, he'd be the president. <laughs> the people we surround ourselves with make a difference. And you're going to make a difference in the lives of so many for their entire lifetime. During the hard times in Ghana, I remember I would always ask my father, why did we come back? 
And one day he said, I came back to make a difference, to help restore democracy to Ghana. And he said to me, because in the final analysis, you will be remembered for one of two things, the problems that you create and the problems that you solve. And he said, my child, find some good problems to solve with your life. That is why I came back. I didn't quite understand what he meant, but a few years back when I went back to bury him and I saw thousands of people pour into his funeral, including the then sitting Democratic government cabinet that he had helped put back in place. It was the problems that he had helped solve for his beloved country that they talked about. I understood clearly then that we must all find those problems that we can solve with our lives, with our talents and with our passions. And so service is a big cornerstone of what we do at Next Galaxy and also with what I do with my life. Always looking for good problems to solve and ultimately get rewarded for those. I'll share the last story with you. It's of a little boy, Timmy, in his kindergarten class. The teacher asked them to draw whatever they wanted to draw. Everyone was done. Timmy was still back in the corner drawing. So his teacher said to him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the class laughed and the teacher said, but no one knows what God looks like. Timmy stood up, excited, his eyes as wide as plates. And he said, that means they'll know when I'm done with my picture. <laughs> that means they'll know when I'm done with my picture. Today with technology, we all have access to the resources to paint a new picture of possibility for our world. What will be unveiled when we're done with our picture? What will be unveiled when we're done with our picture? Before I got, as I was walking onto the passage where I was getting onto the airplane, I looked back to wave goodbye to my family. I saw my father, my hero, cry for the first time. And these were the words that he left me with. He said to me, he said, my daughter, Africans are quite dramatic. <laughs> my daughter, my hope for you is that you will always see our world with a sense of wonder. And my wish for you is to make magic wherever you point your focus. Today, as we turn this new chapter, this new academic year, as I stand here, I have the same hope and the same wish for you that you all continue to see our world with that sense of wonder and to make magic wherever you point your focus. I'll see you all in the future. Thank you very much.